Do you drink wine or strong drink? Well, isn't that special? If so, I'm not here to stop you. Do you not drink wine or strong drink? Drink up, wussy! If so, I'm not here to start you. If you drink wine and strong drink, you've probably been judged by someone who doesn't. If you don't drink wine or strong drink, you've probably been made fun of by someone who does. Whether you do or don't drink wine or strong drink, you've probably realized this. There are going to be some people in this life that you just can't please. Jesus experienced this firsthand. Luke 7, 33-34, Jesus is speaking here of the elite religious people of the day, the Pharisees and those learned in the law. For come has John the Baptist, neither eating bread nor drinking wine, and you are saying, a demon has he. Come has the son of mankind, eating and drinking, and you are saying, lo, a man gluttonous and a tippler, a friend of tribute collectors and sinners. Two of the greatest men to ever live couldn't please some people. John the Baptist didn't drink wine and was accused of having a demon. Jesus was accused of drinking excessively. You're damned if you drink and you're damned if you don't. But I encourage you to be like these two great men and not look to the crowd for approval, but look to your Father in heaven. I have an idea. It might be dangerous. Let's see together what God says about this often divisive subject of wine and strong drink. He says some things that might just surprise you. So please grab a pint and join me. We're so used to hearing prohibitions against drinking wine and strong drink that many may be very surprised to realize that God says enjoying wine and strong drink is perfectly acceptable to him. Moses said something very interesting to the Israelites regarding wine and strong drink, something that you probably won't hear from the pulpits of Orthodox Christianity. Deuteronomy 14, 22 through 26. You shall tithe, yea, tithe all the yield of your seed which is coming forth from the field year by year. You will eat before Yahweh your Elohim in the place where Yahweh your Elohim shall choose to tabernacle his name, the tenth of your grain, your grape juice, and your clarified oil, the firstlings of your herd and of your flock, that you may learn to fear Yahweh your Elohim all the days. Yet in case the way is too much for you, so that you are not able to carry it, because the place where Yahweh your Elohim shall choose to place his name is far from you, seeing that Yahweh your Elohim has blessed you, then you will convert it into silver, bundle the silver in your hand, and go to the place that Yahweh your Elohim shall choose. You will give the silver for anything after which your soul may yearn, for one of the herd, or one of the flock, for wine, for intoxicant, or for anything which your soul may ask of you. Then you will eat there before Yahweh your Elohim, and you will rejoice, you and your household. Yahweh, the God of Israel, wanted fellowship with his chosen people, so he chose a place in the promised land where they were to meet with him yearly for this feast. The original location of the feast was in Shiloh, then later it was moved to Jerusalem. Moses told the people in verse 23, You will eat before Yahweh your Elohim, in the place where Yahweh your Elohim shall choose to tabernacle his name. And what would they eat? The tenth of your grain, your grape juice, and your clarified oil, the firstlings of your herd and of your flock. God was going to blessed the people with abundant crops, herds, and flocks, and he told them to use their tithe of the crops, herds, and flocks to celebrate this yearly feast with him. Some people lived far from the feast location and couldn't carry all their tithe to the feast, so they could convert their tithe into silver and carry that to the feast. And Moses said this, you will give the silver for anything after which your soul may yearn, for one of the herd, or one of the flock, for wine, for intoxicant, or for anything which your soul may ask of you. Then you will eat there before Yahweh your Elohim, and you will rejoice, you and your household. The Hebrew word shikar is translated here as intoxicant in the concordant version, and strong drink in the King James version. It is literally that, an intoxicating strong drink. And Yahweh told the people to enjoy strong drink if that was their desire, or they could drink something else if that was their desire. In 1 Corinthians 10 31, the Apostle Paul says, Whether you are eating or drinking or anything you are doing, do all for the glory of God. So if you like to eat dead animals, do it for the glory of God. If you like Jack Daniels, enjoy that for the glory of God. If you prefer to eat and drink other things, do that for the glory of God. Do all things for the glory of God and rejoice in his goodness, for he is the giver of all good gifts. 
Psalm 104, 14 through 15. Yahweh, my Elohim, you are the one making grass sprout for the beasts, and herbage for the service of humanity, to bring forth bread from the earth, and wine that makes the heart of mortal rejoice, to make the face lustrous with oil, and bread that braces the heart of mortal man. Please notice the word rejoice in connection with wine. Yahweh has given wine that makes the heart of a mortal rejoice. The Hebrew verb for rejoice is samach. Vine's expository dictionary of Old Testament words says, Samach usually refers to a spontaneous emotion or extreme happiness which is expressed in some visible and or external manner. It does not normally represent an abiding state of well-being or feeling. In this wicked eon that is filled with pain, suffering, and death, our hearts are hurt in many ways. Anything that God gives to humanity that makes the heart rejoice is a good thing, including wine. Do all things for the glory of God and rejoice in his goodness, for he is the giver of all good gifts. Along with God's good gifts of wine and strong drink and his condoning of the enjoying of wine and strong drink, there are also many warnings in the scriptures regarding the abuse of wine and strong drink. Let's look at a few now. Proverbs 21. Wine is a mocker, an intoxicant, or strong drink, a discomfitter, and anyone inebriated by it, he is not wise. Intoxicant is a discomfitter in that it can cause roaring, loud speaking, and wailing. In this wicked eon, it seems like most good gifts from God can be abused. Whoever is inebriated by wine and strong drink is not acting wisely. Proverbs 23, 29-35 Who has woe? Who has uneasiness? Who has quarrels? Who has deep concerns? Who has gratuitous injuries? Who has bloodshot eyes? They have who delay over wine, who come to investigate a blend. Do not stare at wine when it is red, when it casts its sparkle in the cup and goes down evenly. Its after effect shall bite like a serpent and spread pain like a viper. Your eyes shall see alien things, and your heart shall speak wayward thoughts. You will become like one who lies down on the heart of the sea, or like one who lies down on the top of the rigging. They smite me, yet I am not at all wounded. They beat me, yet I have no knowledge of it. When shall I awake? I shall again seek it once more. Isaiah 5, 11-12 Woe to those rising early in the morning, that they may pursue intoxicant, or strong drink, who are up late in the twilight until wine inflames them. There is harp and zither, tambourine and flute, and wine at their feasts. Yet at the deeds of Yahweh they do not look, and the work of his hands they do not see. How can God give us the good gifts of wine and strong drink and condone the enjoying of these, then turn around and give us harsh warnings against wine and strong drink? God knows, and we all know, that consuming too much wine and strong drink can greatly impair mental judgment and physical control. This is drunkenness, and the scriptures make it clear that drunkenness is bad. But God also knows that someone can enjoy wine and strong drink and rejoice in it without getting drunk. And that is how he intends the one who drinks wine and strong drink to enjoy it without getting drunk. In the same way, he intends us to enjoy his good gifts of sex and food without going into adultery or gluttony. The Apostle Paul gave many warnings against drunkenness, but does not condemn drinking. Ephesians 5:18 And be not drunk with wine in which is profligacy but be filled full with spirit Paul says being drunk is unsafe, which is the meaning of the Greek word asocia, translated here as profligacy in the concordant literal New Testament. No one can deny that drunkenness can be an unsafe condition. I know firsthand how unsafe drunkenness can be. Long before I was a believer, at the age of 17, I was at a house party in my hometown of Montezuma, Iowa. I was there with a lot of my high school friends. We were drinking. We were having a good time. It was a small town, so this was the place to be. There wasn't a whole lot else going on. It got to be late. I was tired. I wanted to go home, so I decided to drive home. I only lived a few blocks away from where the party was at, so I thought, no problem. I'll be fine. I'll make it home, and I'll go to bed. But on the way home, I decided to go out to my friend's house, who lived several miles out into the country. So I went out to his house. 
he lived on a gravel road and it was dark it was late at night i was starting to really be affected by the alcohol and i was driving up and down the gravel road pretty fast if you grew up driving on gravel roads you know that going 40 50 or 60 miles an hour on a gravel road is not uncommon that's just how we drove so i was speeding up and down this road trying to find my friend's house and i passed out the alcohol came into full effect on me. My car went into the ditch and the driveway that went across the ditch to my friend's house, I hit that head on. My car ramped up and over the driveway and landed nose first on the other side of the driveway. I'm not sure how long I was out. I woke up, there was blood all over. Thank God I was still alive. And because I was close to the house, I walked up to the house. My friend wasn't there, his mom was there. She answered the door and she was shocked. I assumed my face was covered with blood. I had a huge gash in my forehead. You probably can't see the two inch scar that's still there. It's pretty much blended into my regular skin over the years, but I had pretty serious head injury. So my friend's mom called my parents, they came out to pick me up, and they took me to the hospital. I was very fortunate and blessed by God to not have died in that car wreck, which totally obliterated the car. And one more quick story about how I know firsthand how unsafe drunkenness can be. My older brother Troy, who was my only sibling, was a bartender. And one night at the age of 23, he had finished work and was driving out on the highway and he had been drinking. And he lost control of his car. The car went through the ditch and up into a field and he was tossed out of the car. He broke his neck, he was rushed to the hospital and from that point on, for the rest of his life, he was a quadriplegic. He died eight years later in 1999 at the age of 31. And his death was the result of complications from his quadriplegia. This for me is the worst situation in my life that has resulted from drunkenness. To be honest with you, I'm not sure if my brother was a believer when he died or not. But I know because Jesus is the Savior of all that I will see him again and he will not be in his wheelchair any longer. He will be given a powerful, incorruptible, and immortal body like the rest of us. Now let's take a look at a few more of Paul's warnings concerning drunkenness. Romans 13, 12 through 14. The night progresses, yet the day is near. We then should be putting off the acts of darkness, yet should be putting on the implements of light. As in the day, respectably, should we be walking, not in revelries and drunkenness, not in chambering and wantonness, not in strife and jealousy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and be making no provision for the lusts of the flesh. 1 Corinthians 5, 9 through 11. I write to you in the epistle not to be commingling with paramours, and undoubtedly it is not as to the paramours of this world, or the greedy and extortionate or idolaters, else consequently you ought to come out of the world. Yet now I write to you not to be commingling with anyone named a brother, if he should be a paramour, or greedy, or an idolater, or a reviler, or a drunkard, or an extortioner. With such a one, you're not even to be eating. These are very strong words from Paul. He is talking here about believers relating to other believers. He's not talking about those outside the believers group, those in the world at large. He's talking about those in the ecclesia, also known as the church. If someone is named a brother, we are not to co-mingle with him if he is a paramour, or greedy, or an idolater, or a reviler, or a drunkard, or an extortioner. Does this mean we should not co-mingle with a brother who stumbles and gets drunk, but that is not his typical behavior? No. Paul is talking about a named brother who is a drunkard, meaning that's one of the main characteristics of him as a person. It's one of the things he's known for. It's his lifestyle, and he may very well think that drunkenness is acceptable behavior. Paul says, with such a one, you're not even to be eating. Galatians 5, 13 through 25. For you were called for freedom, brethren. Only use not the freedom for an incentive to the flesh but through love be slaving for one another. For the entire law is fulfilled in one word in this, you shall love your associate as yourself. Now if you are biting and devouring one another, beware that you may not be consumed by one another. Now I am saying walk in spirit and you should under no circumstances be consummating the lust of the flesh. 
For the flesh is lusting against the spirit, yet the spirit against the flesh. Now these are opposing one another, lest you should be doing whatever you may want. Now if you are led by spirit, you are not still under law. Now apparent are the works of the flesh, which are adultery, prostitution, uncleanness, wantonness, idolatry, enchantment, enmities, strife, jealousies, furies, factions, dissensions, sects, envies, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the like of these, which I am predicting to you, according as I predicted also, that those committing such things shall not be enjoying the allotment of the kingdom of God. Now the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, meekness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. Now those of Christ Jesus crucify the flesh together with its passions and lusts. If we may be living in spirit, in spirit we may be observing the elements also. Paul is writing to believers about the battle that exists within the believer, one who is in the body of Christ, one who has been sealed with the Holy Spirit. First, notice Paul tells them, You were called for freedom, brethren. Realizing that you are free in Christ is essential to living in that freedom. Living well in that freedom also means we are to use not the freedom for an incentive to the flesh. Freedom is great, but it can be abused. Paul told us how free we are and how to use and control that freedom by his statement in 1 Corinthians 6.12, All is allowed me, but not all is expedient. All is allowed me, but I will not be put under its authority by anything. Proper use of freedom is based in love. Paul tells us, through love, be slaving for one another. And verse 14, For the entire law is fulfilled in one word, in this, You shall love your associate as yourself. In verses 16 and 17, Paul reveals the combatants that dwell within us and battle in each of us, the flesh and the spirit. Verse 16, Now I am saying, walk in spirit, and you should under no circumstances be consummating the lust of the flesh. For the flesh is lusting against the spirit, yet the spirit against the flesh. Now these are opposing one another, lest you should be doing whatever you may want. Because we have both the spirit and the flesh opposing each other in us, we always have opposition to what we really want to do, whether good or bad. If we want to follow the lusts of the flesh, cut loose, and dive headfirst into the works of the flesh, the spirit within us opposes that desire. If we want to crucify the flesh and do what is right, the flesh in us opposes that desire. That internal conflict is always within us, sometimes raging more fiercely than other times. Obviously, being led by the spirit and not by the flesh is preferred. And Paul tells us how we can know if we're being led by the spirit or doing the works of the flesh when he lays out the manifestations of each, starting with the works of the flesh in verses 19 through 21. Verse 19. Now apparent are the works of the flesh, which are adultery, prostitution, uncleanness, wantonness, idolatry, enchantment, enmities, strife, jealousies, furies, factions, dissensions, sects, envies, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the like of these. Paul lays out enough specific works of the flesh that he has probably touched on every individual believer's weakness or weaknesses. Someone who has a problem with drunkenness may not be tempted at all in many of these other areas. An envious person may not even drink wine or strong drink. And Paul also reveals to us the fruit of the Spirit in verses 22 through 23. Verse 22, Now the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, meekness, self-control. There is an opposing fruit of the Spirit that can prevail over each work of the flesh. Looking at drunkenness, we can see that the primary fruit of the Spirit that can prevail over it is self-control. A person who enjoys wine or strong drink properly is self-controlled. Their enjoying of the gift of strong drink doesn't go too far resulting in drunkenness. And the other fruits of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, etc., work in harmony with self-control. To believers who are regularly getting drunk, Paul gives a serious warning in verse 21. I am predicting to you, according as I predicted also, that those committing such things shall not be enjoying the allotment of the kingdom of God. The word committing is the Greek verb prasso, which means to practice. It's continual habitual action, whether it's good or bad. In this case, it's bad. Here, prasso is in the incomplete verb form with action ongoing. This is 
someone whose lifestyle is that of a drunkard. They may or may not justify their drunkenness. This is not talking about a believer who stumbles into drunkenness once or even once in a while. Paul is not saying the believer who is a drunkard will lose his salvation. He will not lose his place in the body of Christ. Christ does not bring someone into his body, then amputate them if they do wrong. But they will not be enjoying the allotment of the kingdom of God in the aspect of ruling and reigning with Christ in the kingdom. In verse 21, the words shall not be enjoying the allotment of the kingdom of God can be rendered ultra literally as reign of God not will be tenanting. These believers will miss out on reigning with God. The believing drunkard in the body of Christ will still have the allotment of Ionian life because that allotment is purely by grace, not by works, as we see in Titus 3.7, that being justified in that one's grace, we may be becoming enjoyers in expectation of the allotment of life Ionian. So the believing drunkard will have the allotment of Ionian life, but will not have the allotment of ruling and reigning with Christ during the oncoming eon. And regarding allotments, another type of allotment can be earned by working with and for our Savior. Colossians 3, 23-24 All whatsoever you may be doing, work from the soul, as to the Lord and not to men, being aware that from the Lord you will be getting the compensation of the enjoyment of an allotment. For the Lord Christ are you slaving. If you drink wine or strong drink, please realize that the freedom to do so is a gift from God. And it's a freedom to be used in accord with the spirit, in accord with self-control, not in accord with the flesh. I encourage you to practice self-control and not drunkenness in the enjoyment of wine and strong drink. I want to enjoy the freedoms that God has given me in this life, and I also want maximum allotments in the next life. And I want the same for you. Have a drink on me.